We are here with Daniel Eckert, who is the U.S. lead for emerging tech for PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the big four consulting accounting finance firms. And he is on the cutting edge of the VR revolution as it applies to the workplace. So he's got a whole bunch of things to share with us uh, today. We have a long list to, walk, to talk through, but uh, you know, just to get started, how are you seeing, what, what are you seeing in terms of VR and what's going on? So first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share some of my insights. Um, this comes from several years. We've probably been working on this for four or five years, focusing in on how these immersive technologies we call it extended reality, so everything from virtual reality all the way through augmented reality, mixed reality, et cetera, how they impact the enterprise and how they can be optimized to improve performance, um, connection with other people. So when I think about what's happening today, I think the big demarcation is that it's ready. This can actually be used today in the enterprise. We've seen it in the consumer space. It's starting to build up momentum. Uh, content around entertainment obviously is a big seller, but we're starting to see this value coming into the enterprise. And it's one of those areas that why we've been looking at it is to extend the human condition using these technologies, either using them in a completely immersive way, like in virtual reality, or in an augmented way, using mixed reality or augmented reality to basically make the experience either more efficient, um, more social in some cases, um, and, and to make the employee actually more productive, uh, especially in the times that, uh, of what we're suffering through right now. Exactly. And, and we're going to dive in uh, deep to that. Just to make it a bit concrete for people, we are talking about, you know, mainly about this one here. This is uh, made by Oculus, a subsidiary of Facebook. When you put this on your head, you are immediately transported anywhere that someone can create. So uh, at that, you know, level one is being transported into that virtual space. Level two is being transported with your colleagues and with your collaborators. So how's that, uh, what's going on in that uh, respect? So I, I, one of the areas that we've been focusing on specifically is around what we call collaborative VR. Um, this is the ability to have several people together in a virtual reality setting as if they're right next to each other. And given the times with everybody being in lockdown and COVID and all of this, this is something that we initially weren't gonna really start pushing into the enterprise until third, fourth quarter this year. But with COVID and everything, um, we actually started doing it in, in February. In fact, we've, we have over 4,000 people that we've brought in, um, you know, between actually between January and today uh, into these immersive situations. So. Imagine, if you will, you're in a workshop setting or you're a small collaboration meeting where there's anywhere from seven to 20 people um, and be able to create workshop activities um, that you would normally have to fly someplace to um, or drive to and take the whole day off to basically do a workshop. Now I can pop in, do an hour or two, do my collaboration session, be it a design thinking session or maybe it's a, it's a readout or an interaction uh, between executives um, and be able to, to, to do it remotely, safely, um, securely, and it was a lot of immersion. It, it, it was a great story. We brought on um, uh, one of our line of services uh, that we wouldn't normally equate with like hardcore technology. And they were like all in, let's try this out. And this was a team of uh, eight uh, people that come from our tax department <laughs> which, is, by the way, is a very huge part of our business. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they wanted to do a workshop, and they had, no one had ever been in virtual reality before. We'd been in lockdown probably now for about three months. These people were used to being with each other four or five days a week, nonstop, all over the world, but they were always physically together. And when we put them in an immersion session um, where everybody was shipped a headset, they put a headset on, they were able to come in and collaborate together in a shared workspace, it was amazing to see the social interaction was the most important thing that they loved the most. They were giving each other high fives. They were giving, you know, big hugs because they hadn't seen each other physically other than through, you know, video teleconferencing for the last three months. And it was really hard because um, we're, we're, we as an organization, our culture is very social, very interactive, and we're, we, we work very collaboratively together. 
and when you take that away, it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of depressing. And so when they were able to do this together, um, the impact of it was just immediate. It was like, initially they were thinking, oh, you know, this is kind of hokey. Uh, I'll put on a headset. Okay, virtual reality. I've read about it. And they put it on and I was like two minutes into it. They're like, holy cow. Mm-hmm. Now I understand. I get it. And then when we took them from that, and put them into an immersion session when they're interacting with multiple people, their peers that they know pretty intimately mm-hmm. um, from working together, it was like, they were so excited. In fact, it was the way we like to describe it. It was like um, giving kids uh, Skittles and M&Ms and putting them to, you know, at a Chuck E. Cheese, you know, eight-year-old boys just running around crazy. Yeah. That's what they were like as adults. Yeah, as, and, as uh, tax advisors at PwC, by the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was very educational for us as well because Amazing. it was like immediately they, they saw the value, they got it. And then once everybody kind of calmed down a little bit and they realized, okay, let's see how we can use this tool, mm-hmm. we started showing them different activities that we were able to recreate from a workshop setting, but also introduce new types of things that you just can't do in the physical world. And that's where the needle actually kind of went, it went all the way over to the far right side. And we're starting to see the productivity and their ability to create new ideas and to communicate more effectively with their clients uh, because they have this ability to connect with them socially, but also maintain, you know, distance and and all the safety that we're required to do today uh, with, with not only between each other, but also our clients as well. Not, uh, so yeah, this immersion so, side is is this um, the 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 interactive collaborative VR is just exploding for us in, yeah. in the enterprise. Yes, and 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 so what I'd like to you know like emphasize it's really hard to you know to ac- explain this to someone. Uh, you have to really try it to understand what we're talking about. So all we're doing right now is kind of illustrating that there's yes. something amazing going on. And, you know, I, I've personally seen all over this, the press, the social media, this whole hype about, uh, you know, everyone moving to remote work, virtual conferencing, you know, this kind of call, et cetera. This, what we're talking about now, I'm just trying to emphasize it for the audience, is a whole different paradigm because not only are we, you know, face-to-face like we are now, but there is... Wherever you look, you're in the, sh- the same space. There's body language. There's, you know, real time, you know, like even uh, eye movements and some of the uh, tools and everything. And it's, it's that sense of presence, that sense of immersion. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Now, how, how did they explain the difference between the VR experience and the normal teleconferencing, video conferencing experience? Well, I, I think the best way to do it is when we're having an interaction like we are right now, video is great. I mean, it, you can, I can read your body language, I can read your eye movement, I can, I can see when you're getting excited about something and when you're passionate about something and when something kind of like, eh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> it's easy to do that. Um, when you get into a group of five or six or seven people on a teleconference, it's really hard to do that. You know, uh, some people don't turn their video on, some people just kind of disconnect and they're, they're doing email or, you know, they're building decks, listening music, watching YouTube, whatever. They're not engaged in the session. When you're in virtual reality, you can't do anything else. You can only be there. You're fully present. And that's really interesting. You can't in check your phone. You, you absolutely can't check your phone. You can't check your email. In fact, it was great. We, we put some very, very senior executives through these immersion sessions and do these workshops. And um, one of my favorite quotes was, it was from a senior vice president of a company um, it was, uh, you know, my age, and, and he was like, initially thought, you know, hey, this is kind of silly, he says, but after 15 minutes of being in an immersion session like this, he says, I completely forgot that I was in virtual reality. Exactly. I was talking to people, and I was expressing myself, and, and my ideas were getting across. That's what was the most important thing, was because everyone was connected. Um, we call this something, we, we, we've been doing this for a long time. And so we started to to see different types of behaviors. In fact, we actually see behavior changing from the way people work in a workshop or how they video conference in the real world versus what they do in the the virtual reality world. Um, And I'll I'll come back to that in a second. But one of the things that we see is like when we can tell immediately when someone disengages because Mm -hmm. they, we call it drift, right? All of a sudden, imagine I'm just sitting there and you're talking to me and all of a sudden I'm doing like, 
<laughs> That's bad right? body language. So it's, it's, it's bad battery language, exactly. The other thing that we've noticed is that when you're in a simulation because you have your controllers and you have your headset and you don't really have a super crazy accurate representation of your face, it's really hard to read someone's face. So far. But you can read body language. Yeah. And so just like in the theater, right, when people are on the stage, their, their motions are grandiose. They're bigger than life. They, they would never do that in the real world, right? But when you're on stage, you have to project your emotions so, because they can't see your face. So you have, to, you have to act a little bit. You've got to be a little animated. Nice. Where in film, you have a much more intimate. It's, it's, things are very subdued. Yeah, so subtle. you can read my face. Virtual reality, you can't do that yet. It's coming yeah. one day, yeah. very yeah. soon, hopefully. Um, but that ability to overemphasize things. We, we, we coach our, our executives that are running workshops this way. It's like, be a little bigger than you normally are. Be a little grander. Because yep. people will respond to that. And when, and when you don't like something, you can put body language in there. That, yep. you know, it says, it's I don't the like VR this. version of emojis. Or exactly. Yep. And, and it's very fascinating to watch this. We're, working, um, we're starting a project in September with one of the major universities here in the United States that we're actually going to study the psychological behaviors of people in virtual reality, in these collaborative sessions, because we're seeing behaviors are different. Um, just like in the internet, you know, no one knows you're a dog, right? So everybody has, especially when you get into online gaming or things where people are doing online, and there's a lot of anonymity there, people behave differently. Well, in the virtual world, you're starting to see some of that come into play as well. So people say or do things or have body language that's just a little different than what their real personalities are like. So we're trying to understand why. And so we, we work in with this university, and um, like I said, we're going to start this in September. Um, we did some preliminary work on this um, uh, about two years ago, and then we started looking at it really deeply when we started to take, when this started to take off in February. Um, but I, you could just feel there's something, there's something unique there, and it would really bring in the academic side of the, the house to understand why is it that that's occurring. So we're very excited about the opportunity to work with them. Um, we're bringing our technical expertise and our background in this. They're bringing the, the sociological, physiological, psychological aspects of, of, from the academia. And together, we're, we're hoping to, to, to identify some positives so we can emphasize here are the behaviors that you want to reinforce versus behaviors that you want to attenuate, mm -hmm. right? And just like anything else. So like VR you know, etiquette even, kind of? It, well, think about it this way. When, you, when you're on TV or you're on radio or you're doing a podcast or you're writing something, you have to adapt your communication style to the media, mm. right? To the medium that you're in. It's just it's going to be the same thing with virtual reality. You, you have to adapt to the medium so you can communicate in a, the most effective way. Okay. And um, I, I think it's fascinating. It's, I mean, I'm a tech person. I'm a nerd. Right, I, I fly around my office with my polar hat, and this is the <laughs> softer side of things, and I find it just completely fascinating um, because I've been watching it for so long, and I'm like, there's something here. Um, we, oh, about two and a half years ago, we built a, a prototype in our labs. So I also run the Emerging Tech Labs here at PwC in the U.S. Um, we average about 150 POCs a year, and some of the POCs are obviously on very specific technologies. And we POCs, proof of, proof, proof of concept, proof of concept, micro projects. Yeah. yeah it, usually no longer than six to 12 weeks, right? Okay. Uh, small teams just to validate a concept or a hypothesis or something. And then we use these POCs to build on each other. And eventually they might become a product or a service offering that is delivered by the firm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did was, we were studying VR at this time it was tethered tethered being a, a headset that's wired into a big fancy computer. Mm -hmm. um, and we put, we built a, uh, we grabbed a medical grade biometric device and strapped it to somebody and strapped them into a harness so we can monitor their, their physiological aspects of what's going on inside them yes. while they're put that, in that's a situation. One of the, that's one of the core uh, you know, the core pillars of biohacking is self measurement, self quantification. Yes. We're, we're very familiar with that. And so we wanted to say, let's put them under stress. So at the time, we just grabbed a zombie game, right? You know, and let's increase the number of zombies that are coming at you and see how you respond. 
because um, at the time my son was, I don't know, he was 14 or 15 at the time. You know, so PwC is making zombie games? No, no, no. We didn't make the game. We just, we just grabbed an off-the-shelf okay. game. <laughs> and then we put them in and then we monitored and we, we created a solution where you could see what was going on in headset. And then you would see, we, we were measuring six different biometric markers to see how they would respond to certain situations. Mm -hmm. um, and so th we started it with this. Uh, with the zombie game and and like I'm like I've got all these zombies coming at me my heart rate's going really bad and I'm like oh my god this is too much <laughs> and I do the same simulation with my son and he's like can you Easy. increase the number of zombies please <laughs> <laughs> so it's different for everybody so what we're seeing is now you can create this feedback loop from how the individual is feeling and put it back into the simulation to either increase or decrease the amount of stress that you want to test Case in point, let's say I'm working on an oil rig and a fire rig and a fire breaks out. Um, they train for this, but they, in the classroom when you train, you can't really put them in a fire. So you don't really know how they're going to act. Fireman training is the same way, right? So what happens if we put them in virtual reality and then we put them in a fire? Now I can measure their response and understand, are they okay with this? Um, what kind of training do I need to, to add to their curricula to improve this, to help them reduce that stress? Because we all know when you're under stress, you're going to make more mistakes. When you're calm and cool and collected, you've been in the situation before, you trust your instincts to do the right thing. So this feedback loop of measurement of what we were doing and then simulating the, the, the situation in their headset, we provided a feedback loop. Um, so you can increase or decrease depending on how the, the individual person was receiving that content and how they were acting. Nice. Um, and and so, so some really fascinating things out of that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so that, that, that brings us nicely into one of the core uh, themes of this event about biohacking your work, which is the uh, concept of learning. And VR is a game changer for learning. And you wrote the article, you wrote the PWC, 80% of the PWC report that measured how, um, more of how much more effective VR learning is than other types of learning. Can you talk about that a bit? So we, uh, about 18 months ago, we um, uh, got together with our learning and development team. So just like any large, big organization, you have multiple teams that do multiple things. We know the technology really well, but we didn't really know the L&D side, learning and development. So we partnered with Is that PwC's them. Academy? Um, it's, it's different. Yep. But it's, it, it's, it's part of the same umbrella, if you will. Okay. So it's, it's just one part of the academy. Or yep. I should say the academy is one is part, part of, of the okay. L&D. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we were focusing on creating an internal uh, study that we wanted to study soft skills training. Now, there's been job skills simulation training in VR for, for decades, really, if you think about it. I mean, an example of job skills simulation would be like a flight simulator, learning how to fly an airplane in virtual reality um, is a form of job skill simulation. Just like, yeah, just like, yeah. yes, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. And, and there's a huge, there's a big market, I should say. It's, it's really going to grow quickly here in the next two or three years, and there's a reason for that I will come back to. But um, what we discovered was there really wasn't a whole lot of soft skill training, that ability to teach leadership training, um, dealing with, uh, you know, ethics, uh, bribery and corruption, um, diversity and inclusion, sexual harassment. These are soft skills that you have to be taught. And the challenge with teaching them in the classroom is sometimes people are not as receptive or they're very nervous about saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be looked at as a bad leader. Now, if it's just you and me, that's fine. I'm very comfortable with you giving me coaching. But if I'm in a large classroom, eventually with people that are either my peers or my superiors or my subordinates, and I say something really stupid, that's bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we thought, what would happen if we put people in virtual reality and train these soft skills? And we did one specifically um, that was designed for PwC, um, which was around who to hire, who to staff, and who to give the performance differentiator to. And so we immersed... Um, uh, we studied the differences between people that took this course that were in a classroom, yep. in an e-learn, and in a virtual reality learn. So that was the first part of the study. So we studied the effectiveness of each one of the modalities comparing. Well, what was the sample size for each? 
Um, I can't talk about the exact numbers, yeah. um, but we pulled them from a group of about 1,600 people. It was actually 1, one of the largest. 1,600. They were okay. all new managers um, in the firm. People that uh, were promoted from senior associate to manager uh, had an opportunity to go through this, and they were assigned each one of the modalities. Basically, it's a solid sample size. It's not like five people or, t or 50 people, 20 people, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and I want to be very clear. We, we didn't study this from like an academic study would do okay. it. Or, it was just, this was more of, we were enthusiastic. We wanted to see what the findings were, and we tried our best to do these things. And it represents only PwC, and so we shared the results from what we found testing our, our, our perfect, employees. Perfect. Everybody else's, you know, results may differ because in, in biohacking in biohacking we have the sample size starting at n equals one testing on yourself <laughs> so 1600 is a good uh, you know we're, we're going to take it with a you know some authority so, okay and so we looked at the efficacy of the training that's the first thing and actually the the study was two pieces it was the um looking at the efficacy of the training and then because we're pwc looking at the cost effectiveness of it so how cost effective was it to create in comparison to each of the other modalities as well? And that's really important to understand because one of the biggest inhibitors to virtual reality being in the enterprise today is the fact that it was either A, too expensive or impossible to manage. And we wanted to kind of like look at that really carefully to say, is it too expensive? It's a, it is a little bit more expensive but can you manage it at scale? And when I mean scale, I'm talking 3,000, 6,000, 10,000, 100,000, 300,000 employees. Um, there's a retail company, a very large one, that has trained over 1.25 million people in virtual reality. Nice. Right? So you can scale this out. And yep. that was one of the things we wanted to look at. So when we looked at the efficacy of it, the first thing that we noticed is that training in virtual reality was faster. Um, it was because there's probably no distractions. In fact, um, we came down to the fact that there are, are people that are in virtual reality are four times more engaged than in either of the other two modalities because you can't be on your phone. You can't, um, you can't, you know, check out or talk to somebody else. I'll, you're, you're I'll give a demo. Anything. This is me in VR. I'm looking around and this is my phone. It just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing, there's two other things that we really discovered is that People are 275% more confident when they're trained in virtual reality in comparison to the other modalities. 275% more confident. Yes, 275% more confident. It's okay. this ability yeah. to practice and practice in a way that I'm not being judged. Yeah. So if I'm training a difficult subject, and in diversity and inclusion, it, PwC is a very serious thing. We, we take this topic very seriously, and we've been training for it for a long period of time. And when we, we build these types of DNI into our trainings, we don't pound people on the head. We just make it part of the everyday interaction. So you might be dealing with people that have really, for me at least, really difficult names to pronounce. That it's challenging for me because I don't normally have to pronounce this name. Um, it, it's something that is from a different part of the world that I'm just not privy to. And so if I say the name wrong, because we're using voice interaction, it, it can help me like, Hey, you know, be cautious about that. People are very sensitive to how you say their names. Make sure you say it correctly. Take the time to learn. Right. Um, and so it, it's really interesting when you put them in those situations of who to, who to hire, who to staff and who to give the performance differentiator to, when you throw into the mix now, you've got difficult names to pronounce. Um, everybody's the same, but maybe their color or religion is a little different. How does that impact the way that you decide that who you're going to promote? Um, who, who you're going to give that opportunity to, to excel and get that experience that they need. So it gives you that confidence because no one's judging you. Um, and that's beautiful. And I can repeat the training as often as I want. And my trainer is never going to get exhausted because it's just a digital avatar, right? We also noticed that we had 3.7 times more emotional connection to the contact. In fact, 78% of the people that went through the VR training responded in such a way that it was very interesting to us that they had a, what we call an aha moment. During the training, they realized, wow, I've done that before. That was not cool, mm -hmm. right? And they did it privately. They realized it to themselves like, wow, I, that's a bad thing. 
I shouldn't be doing that. I need to be able to do it this way instead. So that aha moment and the fact that they were more emotionally connected to the content was one of those things that just makes it really receptive for people to learn. Now, I, I don't know that there's, I know there's a ton of science behind it and I don't know it. I'm not that type of person, but I do know that when you are engaged in the content and it's bringing you in through an emotional connection, I'm much more receptive to learning versus if someone's telling me what I need to do and they're just pounding it into my head, I kind of get a little defensive. It's like, well, yeah. geez, man, I, I don't like that. But if, they're, if there's that emotional connection, I'm, I'm more open. And so when you're more open, you have the tendency to listen and learn more effectively. Yeah. And so that effectiveness is important, that emotional connection. Yeah, so, so what, what, what we've got now is uh, you learn faster, you're yes. more confident about the information that you've gained, and you have a stronger emotional connection to the material, which... And you're, uh, less, distra I, I, and you're less distracted. And you're less distracted, yes. So yes. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, you know, uh, bring up the point about uh, some people considering VR to be the ultimate empathy engine because you can tr transport your view into you know, the uh, point of view. Th this is through 60 videos, another, another story. But through you know, like a refugee in Syria or something, you can be yes. and you can look around and, and, oh my God, this is how they're living, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so that, so, and you wrote the, the report and you executed the study on the VR learning. So right. I encourage our audience to look into VR as a, uh, you know, not only as an entertainment device or a socialization device, but also a learning, uh, learning platform. Right. Um, uh, is there anything you want to add to the learning part before we go over to the entrepreneurship uh, chat? So I, I think one of the things that it is that is important to understand is because you're saving time. So we, we looked at all the different cost pieces of this. And because we want to look at is this cost effective? Can I do this now? Can I do it at scale? And so we looked at the fact that, hey, if I'm saving, if, if, it, if I have to take a 90 minute training in a classroom and I can do that same training in 30 minutes, that's an extra hour. Now yes. at PwC, an hour is, I mean, it, we're, we're a time-based organization. A hour. Yes. And so that means I can be billing that hour someplace else and um, I'm, more, I'm getting more effective training in less time. So right. I'm, I, I, I know it more. I spend less time in it. I'm more connected to it. I'm more receptive to new things. It's, a, it's an and exponential so, growth. It's not a linear, right. it's, you know, those things build on, on each other, right? And because we're PwC, the, the fact is, is that we didn't, we took all the little soft things out of it. Like, oh, okay, so you're going to be more emotionally connected. Well, does that have a value? Yes. Well, <laughs> what's the value? Oh, I don't know. I know it has one, but I don't know what it is. So I took that off. Or I'm more confident. I took that off. I'm less distracted. I took that off. Time. I focused only on the time savings because yeah. that's something I could measure. So at 3,000 users, it's 52% more cost effective to deliver than classroom training. Yeah. Now, given the situation, um, I know that I talked to a lot of clients, classroom training today in the United States, I can't respond to the rest of the world, but in the United States, those budgets are gone. Mm -hmm. No one's in the classroom. No one, very, very few company people are in the office unless you're you know, at a storefront or you're dealing with customers where you have to be physically with them. A majority of the training is pretty much, it's really hampered. And so they've been pushing a lot of training to e-learn. And unfortunately, we all know that e-learn um, is good for some things, but it, it's not as engaging as a classroom and definitely not as engaging as a virtual reality learn. So there is, it is more cost effective, even when you include the cost of the headset and the ability to manage it let, and let all me, of those other things. Let me, let me illustrate that. This here starts at 400 US dollars. It's got, uh, it's got a you know, relatively old mobile CPU in here. It's like having a mobile phone uh, you know, uh, Strapped to your face. Power yeah. on your head. But it starts at $400. So if you're, looking, if, you're think, if you're thinking, oh, only PwC can afford this kind of thing, you know, 400 bucks for any kind of event or learning experience, uh, when, you, when you factor in the cost of the training, the cost of the travel, you know, maybe... Yes maybe hotel expenses, et cetera, you can start to <laughs> like, yeah, you can come up with business models where, and, and uh, from, from my personal experience, organizing events in VR, I used to organize community events here in Dubai and, you know, then COVID happened and I switched them into VR and instead of having to cross, you know, cross town, sit, for tra sit in traffic, I just put the headset on and I'm in the space, I'm in the virtual space and everyone's around me. 
So the cost yep. savings, yeah, they definitely they definitely add up. And, and but the other thing that I just want to highlight is that um, if what it was three years ago, before headsets like this one was introduced, um, is that you would have a cable that came out. You were tethered to a very powerful gaming PC. Gaming PC. That was another couple of thousands of dollars. Yes. So we basically think about it this way: you went from a five thousand dollar rig headset cable. It's an order of magnitude. To five hundred dollars. Exactly. Right? So that alone is is one of the things that the enterprises start saying, "Say, well, hold on a second. I mean, this is cheaper than a mobile phone. Yep. In, in the United States, at least, it's it's mm -hmm. significantly cheaper than a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And if I can provide a bunch of different things to it, at what point in time can I cost justify it? And so there's a in the report, especially we go really deep into things that you'd want to consider if you want to do something like this at scale. That I would encourage you to read because I. I when you think about from a technology perspective, one of the big things that I've seen about VR is it requires like multiple little disciplines. And this goes pivots really well into the entrepreneurial conversation. It requires not just an IT person, but a network person, a security person, operational management person. You need to have obviously program managers. You need to have content creators. Content creators now have to get into, they also have to be L&D specialists. Or if you're capturing media in 360, you need to have film producers and sound designers. Um, you have to have interactive designers. You have to bring in HR. You have to bring in legal because what can I say and what can I say? <laughs> what happens if it crosses a border and goes into a different country? And I can't talk about those things in that country, but I can talk about them in a different country. So all of these things, there were 15 different groups that participated in this study. Mm -hmm. And it just made us realize, wow, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And But the good news is it's doable and it's doable now. You don't have to wait anymore. It's not, this is not something on the horizon. We think it's actually best done in the enterprise as part of a, a kind of a multimodal type of thing. So classroom when appropriate, e-learn when appropriate, v-learn when appropriate. If you mix the three of these up, you will give the best training experiences to your employees. Okay, so let, let's uh, you know transition from that into the entrepreneurial conversation because I think that uh, you know if anyone's looking for a new career opportunity or something to get into, this is a, an interesting uh, interesting bet. So, uh, what what do you see as being? How, how do you position the entrepreneurial opportunity? Um, well, I don't like to put it into a little box. It can be whatever <laughs> you want it to be. Um, remember, you're creating a virtual world. It can be whatever you want it to be. If you want to create a solution that is, hey, this is how to meditate more effectively, or this is how you actually uh, look for water damage in your house before you, before you buy a house, or if I want to kill zombies, I can do all of those on the same device. And it's only up to your imagination. The challenge is, is most entrepreneurials don't necessarily are technical enough to create those types of experiences. They have the ideas. They know what they want to do, but they don't know how to create it. Yeah. The good news is, is the tools that are coming, and there are tools that are available today that give you this ability to no code it, right, or very little code. So you can do it, create your own experiences. I was at a, um, an event last year um, where it was just a lot of entrepreneurs coming in. These are one or two person teams and what they were able to create with very little to no money was shocking. You have a headset, you've got, uh, if you're doing interactive 360, you got a four or $500 camera maximum. You got a little workflow issue. You have an idea. If you can produce web pages or videos, <laughs> you can create a, a VR application today. There are these no code tools that are available. And the companies that are very technical, the companies that are building these tools uh, are the ones that I think are, are kind of where the initial, I mean, yeah, entertainment is always big, but it's the tool creators. Those creators are the ones that will, in essence, cash out because they'll sell these tools to others um, so they can create. So um, it, it, it just really depends. But from an entrepreneurial perspective, literally it's only it's up to your imagination every day i find something new that it's like wow i never thought of that before yeah. that's really cool and and one thing that you you've said and that i always say is that building for vr now is like building for the app store 
you know, I, I'm, I normally say 2008. You, 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 you say it's, uh, it's a bit earlier. What is it, a bit earlier, a bit later? But like, you're the pioneer. So think about it this way. If the, if the, the smartphones have been around a long time before 2007, when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone in January 2007, we had Blackberries, we had Trios, there, you know, Compact was even before that. There were a lot of little devices, but when, when Apple introduced that and put it all together in one fancy device, and then they added the App Store in 2008, that's when everything changed. So if we think of that and think about where we've come in the last 12 years, remember, think about it this way, you know, the, the App Store was created in 2008, and it's 2020, so 12 years. Think of that for a second, what's happened in 12 years. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about where we are in VR, you know, I would argue that we're probably somewhere around that 2005 range, 2004, we're in the beginning. Anything that you create today- You're a leader. A, you're a leader, uh, but most of all, you're learning. You can take what you've learned on how to do that and apply it to the next project or the next activity that you're gonna do. And you're the one that's gonna move this. The app store would not be where it is today without content creators. As, as just like in media, content is king. Mm -hmm. If you can create content that is either enterprise focused on the commercial side or in, in individually focused on the consumer side, um, and that's just gonna create a normal demand. Just like if you even go back even farther back to the um, the mid 90s, right in the late 90s, when people started creating web pages, it's the same. It's the same trajectory, yep. right? You, you, if you follow it historically, technology tends to follow these same themes. And when you add convergence into this, which is the ability to add multiple technologies to create something unique, that's when disruption and innovation occur. Exactly. So, and this here, this here, you know, I, I liken this particular headset to the old Motorola phone, the big, uh, you know, Wall Street phone. It works, <laughs> it's good, okay? But, you know, when Apple releases their VR solution, whatever it's gonna be, they will, that will be the iPhone. That, that's when things will really tip. So anyone building now has a first mover advantage. Now, now how do you um, solve the, how, how do you think about the dilemma of building for the VR platform when the reach is a little bit lower? There's a couple of million VR headsets like this out in the wild or so, whereas two billion, three billion smartphones how do, you, how do you see the dilemma between the distribution and, uh, you know, kind of uh, reach and everything? It's a, it's a, it's a question that the, the press has been talking a lot about a couple of months ago. And, and they said, you know, VR is dead. You know, the, the people aren't buying it. And it's like, don't listen to that. <laughs> Think about you're creating something. Now, what's really nice is remember, go back to what you said. That headset is really nothing more than a phone on your face. The same technology that you use to build your, your uh, um, experiences can also be distributed on mobile phones. In fact, we're seeing this a lot is that we'll create a VR solution, um, especially around training, and can someone join? Can someone experience that same solution on their phone or their tablet? And the answer is yes. So it's just another endpoint in the experience. It just happens to be a really immersive endpoint, and for people that have those headsets, they like it that much more. And, so and it, if you, you think about grow. it, cross, yeah, you can, I'm just saying is you can grow just like you started building web pages and then the web page developers actually moved into mobile app development. They'll eventually move into uh, VR development as well. And, and also the, uh, the main, one of the main VR platforms you're talking about the tools, which, uh, you know, people can use unity. It's just another export to export to, that, so it works on a mobile phone or it works on a VR or it works on a Windows uh, desktop, et cetera. So those, those things are accessible and you can, you can pull in uh, objects and libraries. Oh, you want a, a grassy knoll. There's a grassy knoll, you know, dumped in. You don't have to code everything. You don't have to build everything. Now, one, one thing that I, I want to, like, we're, we're on the, the, the tail end here. I want to um, just share with the audience our, our conversation the other day where I said about one of my experiences I'm trying to have all of my VR, you know, I'm building in VR, I'm, I'm trying to have all my VR related meetings in VR with, with other people, you know, just to eat, eat our, drink our own champagne. Uh, and <laughs> so there's one tool, there's one tool called Spatial or an app called Spatial where you can go in, there's a whiteboard 
and you can throw something onto the whiteboard. But the coolest thing was that what, what, I, what I felt was the coolest thing, and it's kind of like magic when you're in VR, is you can type a search, type, I said, uh, cat, and then you press enter, and then all of a sudden, a 3D object of a cat appears in your space. And you're like, oh, no, I don't like that cat, next cat. And then there's another 3D cat. So they've, they've linked into a library, and it's kind of like magic being able to spawn any kind of object. And, and when I told you that, you said, why do you have to type it? Yeah, <laughs> my point is, is that you've got a microphone in the headset. Why can't you just say it? And, and by the way, you, within that specific tool and other tools that we've tried, they have this voice interface where instead of typing, because I'll, I'll admit the hardest thing to do in virtual reality is type. Yeah. It's awful. You have to go like um, however, this, like pushing yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like hunting and pecking and exactly. with no tactile feedback. Yeah. Um, so why can't I just use my voice? In fact, all of our simulations that we build are all voice enabled. In fact, you don't even need controllers. You just do it with your voice. Yeah. And so using voice is critical. In fact, what we've seen is we expect to see um, kind of like your, your version of, you know, a bot. You know, any one of the devices, you know, it could be Cortana, it could be Siri, it could be Google, it could be Apple, whatever, um, Amazon, any one of those, being able to actually have that available to you in session. So I could say, and from a commercial perspective in the, in the enterprise, if I'm in a VR session, I want to actually say, oh, um, my boss just sent me a message. Can you bring it up into whatever experience I have? Can I bring it up and see it? Mm -hmm. uh, think about it as just like if I'm driving, right? I've got to stay focused on the road, but I can still, I can have my messages read to me. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't you do the same thing in, in a simulation as well? Because mm -hmm. we are in a multimodal world. We have to be able to connect multiple channels in real time, but be able to say, hey, um, hey, you know, virtual reality bot, please bring up, um, bring up a cat. Um, oh, I want to see a cat and a dog playing on a beach. Next oh, level. I want to see a cat and a dog playing on a beach on Mars. Yeah. Right. And just keep and but being able to have that context, being able to use your voice, because that's the most that's the easiest of interfaces. Once you understand the language, it's the easy of interfaces to engage in. Uh, OK. Other than. And, so. and then where, where you're going with that, you know, I, I was really impressed at being able to, like, bring a, bring a cat into, into my virtual space. What you're talking about now is the convergence of AI and no code yes. development and that kind of thing. And so let's, uh, you know, in wrapping up, let's uh, speak to a little bit about the future, you know, 10 year, 10 year vision, 20 year vision, where do you see things going? So w our group, we tend to look at between zero and five years. Okay. Um, anything beyond five years is, if I knew that really where everything was going 10 years or 20 years from now, I, I would be a king of Wall Street, believe me. Be on the yacht. Uh, I, yeah, I'd do it for my yacht. Um, <laughs> preferably, <laughs> anyway. So, but the reality is, is what we're seeing is that it's, you can actually read the tea leaves and see where this is all going. Um, I actually see a world where you'll have either an HMD, a head-mounted display, pair of glasses like what I'm wearing, or an ocular implant that's probably more 20 years plus out, where you have this ability to receive information and see information overlaid the real world in real time. That is the future. And you can actually do this now with your phone, right? I can put my phone up. There's a, both in Android and iOS. You can bring your phone up and, and create an augmented reality experience to see it. And by the way, the same code that you use to create VR solutions can also be used to create those AR solutions as well. So that's a plus. So whatever you're building, you can port it to other places. Um, but the whole point is that you'll be able to see that. Now, there's times when I need full immersion, right? Where I want to just be in a computer synthetic world for whatever reason. Um, I'll be able to do the same thing. So these, how when today you're on the spectrum of I got full immersion and then I've got, you know, synthetic overlay and, and augmented reality, and it's a continuum. I eventually see that this is going to combine into a single device that you as an end user will be able to choose how much immersion are you willing to deal with. If I'm at home and I'm not walking about, uh, maybe I want a full immersion. But if I'm walking about in the public, I want to be able to see the real world around me as well. Um, but if I'm talking to somebody, I get information on them to help me engage with them in the appropriate way if I don't know it. 
um, or if I'm going to some place and I'm looking for something, or if I'm doing my job, which is the way I look at it, is I'm, I want to have the fourth area that we look at is something we call job aids. I want to be able to see what my next steps in the process are in my field of view without impacting my hand coordination. Because if I have to be holding something yeah. while I'm doing my job, I'm no longer safe, mm -hmm. right? And if the AI that's helping me do that is helping me to the next step or identifying a problem that I've not picked up in my field of view or it actually pulled off of the equipment in real time, you know, it's like, say, hey, you've got a, a, you know, a, a, a faulty valve here that you need to take a look at because we're picking this reading up. Or think about it this from a health perspective from biohacking is um, I noticed that it's, it's, it's outside, it's 95 degrees, it's 84% humidity and your heart rate's at 165 and you're only moving at about two and a half miles an hour. Might be a good idea to go inside and sit down, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's just a simple thing or the fact that it can start reading these things and actually start presenting information to you based on your physiological behavior, Absolutely. right? It notices that, you know, something about your personality that you might want to like, Oh, I'm excited. I want to, Hey, there's a sports yep, game. Your blood on, sugar, your heart rate variability, yeah. your stress levels, cortisol, you know, who knows all, all, the all right up there. It's, it's all up to the imagination. In fact, one I'm, I was on a, uh, a panel recently where we talked a little bit about it was what we're actually seeing is the convergence of technology and, and, and humans coming closer and closer together to the actually the humans will be augmented. Today we're augmented with ex, exoskeletons or things like glasses, mm -hmm. you know, little things that are mechanical in nature. Of course, then you've got your phones to, to, <laughs> to really expand, but eventually this is going to be just become part of you. Just like your, your smartwatch is today, mm -hmm. there will be other things that will potentially be inside of you mm -hmm. that will help. I mean, we're seeing this in medicine already where you can put sensors into uh, your body that your phone can read in real time so you don't have to have uh, someone to prick your skin to take a blood sample. You can actually get it in real time from your system. So it's just a matter of time before this becomes more common and, of course, safe um, and secure. That's the key. It's got to be secure. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those things are coming together, and I think that's the exciting thing about where we'll see this all going hopefully before I retire. Um, so okay. very excited about wh what's coming in the space specifically. So I think we've, I think we've nailed it, sir. I think that's been an amazing uh, session. Uh, what, what I'd like you to do for the last uh, 30 seconds or so is um, if there's one idea that you'd want to share with our audience or have them think about, sorry to put you on the spot, but what would that be? And we might use this for social media as well. <laughs> um, Anytime we talk about technology, a lot of people are always reticent. Says, oh, it's not there yet, or I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about it. And, and I'm one of those people, I'm sorry, I'm going to dip myself in gasoline. I'm going to light my self on fire, and I'm just going to jump into it and see what happens. This is like the greatest part of what's happening in our world today is you can go try all these different things. Find out what makes them work. If you're a hacker mentality or a maker mentality, now is the time to be able to start investigating. We are at the beginning of a whole new technical transformation that is going to occur over the next 15 to 20 years. You, by, if, by you sitting around doing nothing, it, it is why? <laughs> it's so boring. Why not go make the future yourself? You have the mentality to do it. Just go do it. Make it happen. Because it's because of people like you that the needle actually moves and don't be afraid of it. Embrace it because you will learn so much from both your successes and your failures. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yep. Until the uh, Thanks, next guys. episode.